know that if my office hours don't work for you, you can arrange other times. Um, I would expect, especially with an evening class, if I have day office hours, it might not be like the best time for you, but we can arrange something else. The other thing I do in this class and in all my classes is I offer you the opportunity to come in to any of my other classes' labs. All right? I have, um, I, I have a day and evening class Monday through Thursday. So I have a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So. Um, Pretty much, regardless, you know, it, it, for example, if you wanted to come, you could come to my evening classes lab, which is the same time as this classes lab is. Or if you are available during the day, you could come either to my Monday, uh, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday daytime lab. It's probably best to ask in advance, so like I know that you're coming, all right, and you know, in case you have a special activity in lab or something like that, and I can tell you the room and the times and all that. So. That, that's a nice option, and, and I make the same offer to other students. So if you see other students from other classes, that, that's what they're doing there. I, I mean, it makes more sense to me to do, uh, it, it's like, really, it's like extending my office hours, you know. For the most part, what do I do in lab? I, I sit there, you know, and people have questions, I answer them. But I can, you know, I can answer questions from a couple different classes if students from different classes are in there. All right. Here are the outcomes and the course description. Those are important. Um, the book is this book by Deedle, Deedle, and Deedle. <laughs> Deedle times three, Deedle to the third power. It's actually a, a, a good book. Uh, it's, it's one of the best introductory books that I've seen. Oh, you do? Okay. Oh. We, we can look at it. I believe it's different. A lot of times what they do is, you know, they will write and they will like, some of the chapters might be similar, but, but we can take a look to, to tell for sure. Um, one thing I like about this book, and we'll talk a little bit this, about this more in, uh, when we get to the schedule, is there's an appendix that talks a lot about Java programming. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure where you picked it up, at the bookstore? Uh, okay, all right, good. I'm glad it was not that the bookstore has the wrong one. Um, refresh my memory. How, have, have both of you done Java? You were in the Java class, right? And you, I don't know if you were in the Java class, but you, you were? A few semesters back, okay. All right, so you both are familiar with Java. That's one thing that we can do is we can sort of, uh, customize it based on, on the other students. Um, I think the other student that's enrolled in here was also in Java, and I think the guy, there, there's, there might be a fourth student that comes in here, and I'm pretty sure he knows Java too. So the one thing I do like about this book is it does have the appendix to sort of review, just in case you're a little rusty uh, uh, in, in Java. Because it's conceivable, the way the prerequisites are arranged, that you could be in this class without having taken Java. So. Uh, I, that was a priority of mine to make sure that, you know, uh, that, that there wasn't the assumption that you were uh, a Java expert. And again, I, I, even if you've taken Java, if you, you know, a little rusty on it or whatever, you know, this will serve as a good reminder. Uh, you, you should have some sort of storage media. Uh, I really do need to change this in future semesters and cop saying, please bring your diskettes in. Uh, Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right, right. Even, even things like, like dial your phone. You know, phones don't have dials anymore, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting how the terminology uh, goes. Um, instructor approach, you can read through this. Um, all I will say about this is, is almost everything I say in this, you can take to about the 10th power in a class that this is, that this is small, you know. So if you're having trouble, you know, by all means ask. Uh, especially in, in this class, given that it's, it's the first time I'm teaching this class, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still learning how to teach this material. So I haven't worked through all the kinks for that. So please don't hesitate to ask the questions. Do check Angel in the time between classes. Um, if, for example, there's a question that you ask in class that I don't have the answer to, or if there is um, uh, 
some sort of announcement, like I'm not going to be here. Um, there is one date in November I might not be here. Um, and I know I have jury duty, but that shouldn't affect this class in October. But I'll post announcements uh, to Angel as well. In addition, I'll offer feedback on your assignments, and, and you have the opportunity to redo them. College policies, late work policies, pretty consistent with the past. Um, I go, I, you know, I try a lot of different things in my classes, and I'm going to experiment with this one in this class's structure. We're going to have three quizzes in this class. They'll each be worth five points, which is roughly the same as, as a weekly assignment. All right. The weekly assignment, I, I plan on there being a weekly assignment. Uh, there is a possibility that I might double up, you know, and have an assignment cover two weeks, you know. Um, but I plan on having pretty much weekly assignments, smaller, uh, smaller weekly assignments instead of big assignments that, that, that drag on. And then finally, there's, there's a final exam. Part of the reason for the quizzes and the final um, are that there are some questions, or, or how do I want to say it, there, there are some issues that I can't really assess by looking at your code, all right? For example, one of the things we're going to talk about today is, is in the mobile environment, some of the advantages and disadvantages of developing a, an app versus developing simply a mobile website. You know, why would you do one versus the other? Well, I can't tell by your code if you know that, right? You know, you, you may code like an ace, but don't have that conceptual uh, understanding of why one is appropriate and, and under what situations one would be appropriate under what situations the other. So um, I thought I'd, I'd have some quizzes to sort of fill in the gaps in some of that information. Here's the schedule and again um, this section is also times 10, <laughs> right? Schedule subject to change obviously being the first time I'm less confident when I set these dates and times of, of when we'll cover certain material. Um, so we'll, we'll evolve it and we'll see how it goes. Um, homework will be due, I say the Monday of the week. Um, that's wrong. It will be the Tuesday of the week. And quizzes will be the Thursday of the week. So for example, homework one will be due Tuesday of week two. So homework two will be Tuesday of week three and so on. And when there's both the homework and the quiz due, the quiz will be um, uh, on the Thursday. I haven't completely decided the format of the quiz yet, uh, but you'll, you'll be the first to know. All right. Any questions on this? All right. Let's talk a little bit and let's put things in context well not with this we're not um, Let's try this. Let's look at the mobile world. All right, the world of mobile development. As with almost everything else in, in information technology or, or um, just in general, there's alternatives, alternative ways of doing things. If you think about it, that sort of implies that there's advantages and disadvantages of doing it one way or another, right? Because if there was a method of doing something that was all advantages and no disadvantages, there wouldn't be other alternatives, right? I mean, everyone in the world would do it that way, and there'd be no discussion. So whenever, whenever alternative ways of doing things survive, it's because there's reasons for doing it one way and reasons for doing it the other way. 
All right. That being said, our two main alternatives in the world of mobile development are developing apps, sometimes called, you know, you could call them native apps or apps, or doing mobile websites. Let's spend a little bit of time exploring the difference between the two and, and, and looking at specifically the difference in characteristics and how those differing characteristics um, suggest some advantages and disadvantages. So, what are some characteristics of apps versus mobile websites? Or another way to say that, what are some advantages and disadvantages of apps? and mobile websites. We all know the difference, right, between the two? All right. Someone say something about either of those two things. Boy, that's an open-ended question. Yes. <laughs> you see, that's why you got to be careful. Like, if you move them, I'm thinking you're raising your hand. For the most part, the apps can store data. Oh, okay. Pardon me? Well, so they, they store, store the data on the, on the device. Okay. Opposed to mobile. Data stored on device. Can you store data on mobile websites? Different ways. All right. Typically with mobile websites, where is your data stored? On the web, on the cloud. So data stored in the cloud, we'll say, using a good buzzword. For that matter, where do the apps live? The apps live, in the case of an app, an app is installed on a device and the app, or, or sorry, the, the site is in the cloud as well. Other characteristics? Okay. Okay. Uh, that is the deployment issue. Um, must be installed and updated. Not an issue. Because the app lives in the cloud, there is essentially one version of the app. So if the Amazon website, let's consider that, because that's really a web site app, a, a, a web application. There's an enhancement to, um, let's say, Amazon search functionality. When do I get that? Well, the next time I go to Amazon site and do a search, right? It only lives on the server, therefore there's nothing I have to update. All that knowledge is on the server. As opposed to the Amazon app. Let's say there's a bug in the Amazon app. When do I get that bug fix or update? Well, when my app is updated. Now, to be sure, they've done a lot of things to like facilitate the updating uh, of apps uh, compared to you know, the old days, right? You can have your apps update automatically, for example. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll look at my phone and I'll see little arrows. I have no idea what's going on. I'm looking at it's updating the Facebook app or Words with Friends or whatever. Or it can inform you so that you can go in and manually update it if you'd prefer to do it that way. All right? But still, because the app lives on the phone, there's a process to update it as opposed to updating not being an issue. Other facts slash implications of them. Right. You can run that at any point as opposed to a mobile website. Okay. You can run it not connected to internet. Maybe you can do that. Depends on the app. 
this, you know, have to be connected. And that's one thing that's important to understand. I talk about stuff being on the device. Not necessarily everything's on the device. You could be getting information from a service or a, a server there as well. But you do have the potential to be able to, to run it where there's, there's no possibility of doing that for a web-based, um, for, for a, a web application. Other characteristics. We're missing it. Oh, go ahead. Okay. No, that, that that's a, that's an excellent one. Um, and 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 that's sort of an implication of all these things. Um, less vulnerable to uh, yeah to to odd conditions <laughs> for lack of a better word all right again cuz you don't have to be connected it's on your it's on that you can probably get by yeah. with that Other ones. We're missing a we're missing a pretty obvious one. Yes. With, with Android devices, especially, uh, your apps could be hardware specific. Ah. Okay. That is that is a um, well. Let's let's broaden that a little bit further, right? First of all, is, is there an app I can download that will work both on an Android and an iPhone? No. All right. There are versions of the app for each. All right. Android just magnifies that problem. And that is the code is device specific. Now, the, the, the very simplistic manifestation of that is the fact that there has to be an iPhone and an Android version of each app. All right. So if you wanted to, if, if you were an organization and you wanted to have a mobile web presence, you couldn't develop an app and have it installed both on there. Now, from what I hear, there are tools that kind of allow you to transition them. I'm always suspicious about those. All right? Always suspicious about those. Um, but the bottom line is, fundamentally, code that works on an Android won't work on an iPhone and vice versa. So you need two versions of the app. Well, what does that mean? That means you do everything twice. All right? That's a problem, right? You know, you, you got to get it right twice. You uh, have to test it twice. You have to develop it twice. You have to do everything twice. Now, with Android, that can, can become even, even uh, uh, the, the issue gets deeper because there are issues with different devices and there's different versions of the Android operating system. Now, there also are versions of the iPhone operating system, but that seems to happen on a much more regular basis, you know, or, or uh, uh, um, how do I say it, much less frequent basis. So, you, 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 you know, like you, need, you might need iOS 5 for some applications, but other applications run across the board, where Android tends to be a little more touchy about that. All right? So, but the bottom line is, is fundamentally, you know, on a conceptual level, this code is device specific. Whereas this, no. This is web code, which is universal as long as the proper protocols are followed. All right? Okay. 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 Apps can look better. Look better and potentially perform better
in amps, the reason for this, we're going to boil this down, is this is not using standards that are going to be deployed on a variety of things. This is device specific, so you can gear everything to that platform. So you can use all the controls that are available in that platform and all the nice features that are available in that platform. All right. So because of that, you can do more because you're not writing this sort of generic code that gets run and can be displayed on uh, a desktop machine, on a Android device, on an iPhone device, and all that. Um, there's, there's a law in, in, um, in biology that says the better adapted an organism is to one environment, the less well adapted it is to other environments. All right? You know, a fish out of water. Fish are, are optimized for living in water, right? What does that mean? If they're not in water, they don't work at all, all right? You could look at that as saying amps, because they're developed specific to a device, can be better on that device. The problem is, is they don't work on other devices. Whereas a website, which isn't really particularly specifically adapted to a certain environment, all right, isn't going to be quite as good in any given environment, its really benefit is that it's cross-platform. A cousin of this is that an app can take advantage of all the features of a platform. much more easily than you can do that uh, in, in a, uh, in a uh, uh, web environment. So like integrate with your contact list, integrate with, with your, your camera, integrate with um, your to-do list, your calendar. Because you're writing it for one platform, you can make sure that that works. Whereas that's harder to do in a web environment. Couple other thoughts. I, if I could, if I had better handwriting, I would have put the word universal in italics, or maybe we can put quotes around it. Because this is uh, an ideal, right? That, that a web page, you, you create it, and it will look consistently everywhere. We know that's not even the case in, um, in, in the desktop world. Right? If you have, you know, there's a potential for browser and co compatibility issues between platforms and versions of browsers and so on and so forth. So these applications live and are run within a browser. And therefore, there can be browser compatibility issues based on that. No browser compatibility issues here because there's no browser. It's written for that platform and it works on that platform and it works well in that platform. And it, it probably looks better and so on. Um, which are easier to use, mobile websites or apps? Apps, yeah. You want a dramatic instance of that, you know. Probably my favorite way to illustrate this, all right, is go to the Weather Channel app. I click on that, click on the icon, I have the weather. Drum roll, please. All right. Yeah, there we go. I have the weather. All right. What did I have to do for that? I had to click on it. All right? And boom, there it is. How, could I get that same information from weather.com? Yes. I'd have to open my browser. I'd have to type in the URL or look at my bookmarks or whatever. Depending on exactly, I might have to go in and put in my zip code or something like that if it wasn't saved or, or whatever. 
All right. So typically, amps are going to be uh, easier to use. The word I use, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure if this is my original word. I mean, I didn't create the word, but I mean using it in this context, if, if I'm the one that, that thought of using it, or if I read it somewhere, is that amps are simpler because they're a curated experience. All right? Someone picks out what they think you want to see in the app, all right? And gears the app just to do that. So it's written with a real specific purpose in mind, as opposed to the web, which is the Wild West, right? You get out on the web, you can click on ads, you can do this, you can do that, you can do anything you want, as opposed to clicking on that. Now, to be sure, if I was planning a vacation, let's say, and I wanted to see what the weather is going to be in Portland, it might be easier to use the website to do that. It might not. I don't know. I, I have, you know, I don't go anywhere, so I never. I'm planning a vacation, so I've never tried to do that in the in the uh, Weather Channel's uh, app versus their online site. But it's curated. In other words, they define specific things that you want to do. All right, um, and they make it work just for that. Um, I think that covers most of it. All right. The focus in this class obviously is on apps, and specifically apps in the Android environment. All right. Even with mobile websites, there are strategies that you can employ. If you want to, you know, if you just can't get enough of my lectures, you can go and watch my lecture in the web, a mobile web class, where I talk about different strategies you can take. Because even that, even if you decide to take a mobile uh, website, um, there's different um, considerations. Is a mobile website simply your regular website set up to work on a mobile device? It could be if you have a very small, simple website. All right. The, the example I gave is if, you're, if you have a restaurant. Right? If you have a restaurant, your website might contain a menu, might contain directions, might contain your hours. Yeah, something like that. Maybe your desktop website would look the same as, as it would on a mobile device. But for example, Lorraine Community College. All right. If you go to their site on the web, they actually redirect you to another site, or another page rather, I should say, that is a much more simplified view of their website. And it has maybe a dozen links on the home page as opposed to the 45,000 that are on the full site. All right. Um, why is that? Well, chances are users of the mobile website are going to be looking for real specific things. You are not probably going to use the mobile website to research requirements for a degree. You, know? you might use the mobile website to like, find someone's phone number to call them or to uh, look at a campus map if you're trying to find the such and such building, or to find out if it's a snow day or not. All right? That's the kind of things you might use it for. So in that case, they redirect you to other sites and whatever. All right? But that's not the topic of this class. This is the topic. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on developing apps and developing apps in the uh, Android uh, platform. All right. Um, the text has an overview of Android. Um, you know, Android is, is an open source uh, operating system. It, it's been developed and there's enhancements made to it and so on. What I'd like to focus on is, uh, is what the components of the development environment are. All right? And there is, in the book, Chapter 1 that talks about, that gives an overview of Android, so you can read that there, and talks about what you need to run an app, uh, or develop an app and run an app on, on your machine. Now, you can get this information elsewhere. All right, so 
Um, don't think that this is the only place that, that, that they have that. Um, I, I know uh, one student said that they're, they're still waiting for the book. You know, just Google installing Android, Windows, or Mac, or whatever, and, and you can find a lot of this information. What I want to do is I'm not going to walk through the installation process, but I'm going to walk through the components that you need to do this. Okay? Um, because, really, your, your task, your first lab assignment, is to essentially just be able to pull up an app in the Android development platform and give me some screenshots. All right? So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to write any code or, or anything like that. You just have to be able to pull up the app. And we'll talk about how you do that. Dang, I hate when the document camera isn't working. All right. So, what do you need to develop Android apps? Um, the interesting thing is, is really, uh, in, in modern software development, getting your environment configured is a big part of the battle. All right. Um, you know, in the old days, writing a, you know, a, a COBOL program wasn't that hard. There was your computer. Here was your key punch machine. You type in the code in there, you take it to the computer, you run it, you get your answers. All right. Now, because everything is done in sort of a component-based manner, it's important uh, you, you need different components, and you need different pieces, and they need to talk to, to each other. So you get that in Java. The one WebSphere project that I work on, again, worked on, half the battle was getting everything configured right, so that the database is talking to your Java code, and your Java code was talking to your web server, and all that sort of thing. So configuration becomes a huge issue. That's why my suggestion is that you all, for this first assignment, um, I would like you to install this stuff, on your own machine. You know, I, I um, know you both have your own machines and you can do this. So get your development environment set up, all right? Because that's, that's a worthwhile experience uh, to go through. So what do you need? First thing you need is you need to make sure that you have Java installed. So the uh, Java SDK is needed. Java software development is needed. Can we see that there? There we go. Java SDK. Because Android's a Java-based environment. It's one reason that we are we actually have two uh, Android classes and just one Apple class. Apple is its own uh, Objective C. All right. Whereas Java you know, you can leverage your skills in Java in other environments as well as you're doing Android development. This is not required, but it's a good idea to use the Eclipse IDE. IDE is a uh, integrated development environment. So, in theory, you could create an Android app simply by opening up and editing text files, all right, using a simple text editor. Gee, we sure don't want to do that, all right. The framework and the components are so involved that we need a little bit of a help, all right. And you folks know me. I, I in many cases, steer clear from IDEs. In the Java class I did, at least for the substantial part of the class, in basic web development, uh, even in PHP development, I say, nope, code it by hand. Here, the components are so involved and there's so much going on, it, it's, okay to, <laughs> it's okay to get a little assistance via the IDE. And the Eclipse is a popular Java IDE. So Eclipse sits on top of Java and allows you to develop really any sort of Java application, not just Android stuff. All right? You then need the Android SDK, which again is a set of components 
that you need uh, to develop Android applications. You then need the ADT plugin for Eclipse. And don't ask me what ADT stands for. You can Google it if you're interested. But what it, what it does, the, 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 the purpose of it, is it allows Eclipse to talk to the Android SDK. All right. So remember, Eclipse isn't an Android thing. All right. Eclipse is a Java IDE. All right. And in the environment, though, that you want to develop Android applications, that plugin goes in and allows you to use Eclipse to develop Android applications. All right. Next thing you need is Android platforms. You need at least one of these. And think of this as being the versions of the Android operating system that you're going to be developing for. If I'm not mistaken, um, the, example, um, the example code is written for um, Android version 10. So I think what I did or I had them do in, in lab is uh, install version 10 of Android and install uh, the most recent version or, or a, a pretty new version as well. So I installed a couple of them just because, you know, we want to be able to run the applications. Um, you know, we might want to do some older style development. We might want to do some newer style development. Lastly, you either need an Android device or an Android virtual, dev virtual device that is an emulator. All right, and we'll talk about um, that uh, in a second. I do have Android devices. One thing, you know, uh, one thing that I'm a, a big proponent of is, is that an emulator is just an emulator. An emulator is not the real thing. Therefore, yeah, it's good, it's nice and convenient that, that I can go and test it on an emulator, but it ain't tested until you do it for real. All right? And we have several different types of Android devices even that we can go and we can test things on uh, as we need them. And I'll bring those to lab um, at some point. But Certainly, if you're working at home, you're not expected to have every sort of Android device, so running an emulator is okay. All right, so that's what you need. And these things all need to talk to each other and all that. That's why this is kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, installing it isn't a trivial thing like just clicking a button and installing it. So that's what, that's essentially what the homework is, is to go in and install it on your machine, uh, and then be able to pull up one of the example apps and take some screenshots to prove that you did it. Now, let's go in and let's see these in action. Let's go and see the environment here. And I am going to go into here we have the three main pieces of that. Java is already installed. We have Eclipse. We have the Android SDK manager. And we have the AVD uh, manager, which is for the virtual machines. All right. Let's look at that one first because that's pretty straightforward. I can double click on that and it will open up sometime later next week the Android Virtual Device Manager. And what I did is I created one and I've given it a name, I've given it a target, all right, that's the version of the Android operating system um, that I'm going to be running, the API level, and so on. To create a new one, you simply click New, create a name, and then you can go in and you can choose the version of the Android 
API that, that you want to uh, create it for. So, you know, you could do uh, Android 2.1 API level 7 or some of these other ones. It's probably a good idea to have several of these, right? Because you might want to test your app in several environments. But that's the virtual um, device. Um, what if you want to run it on your actual Android device? If you have an Android phone or whatever. You can do that. You can just plug it into the USB. The one thing that you have to do, and it's in a different place depending on the specific device you have, is there will be a setting in your settings that will say something like, allow applications from unknown sources, all right? And allow installation of non-market applications. And by default, that's checked off because most people want to go through the application store. But as developers, we're creating our own applications and we want to be able to run those. So if you check that, then you're able to run it on your device. Um, that will be something to check for when I bring the um, when I bring the Android devices down. You have to make sure that's enabled. Okay, so those are my virtual devices. Here is the Android SDK Manager that we'll take a look at. And this shows all the different versions that I have installed or could install. So it's only showing installed stuff. If I wanted to install something else, I could click that, and then I could go in and click and install, for example, the Android 2.2 uh, API level 8, and so on. So I could install that as well. <laughs> Real interesting here, they have, uh, they have software for the, the Galaxy Tab. <laughs> and this, again, is one of the things where uh, Apple, because they, they control everything, um, has uh, in, in some respects an advantage, right? Uh, because you're really developing for just a very limited platforms. S couple different kinds of hardware, couple different kinds of operating system, that's all you got to worry about. Whereas with Android, you, know, you could be running on any number of different Android devices, all right? So that's where you can go in and install the particular versions of the, the, the platform uh, and all that. I'm going to fire up Eclipse now. And through Eclipse, you can actually get to these other managers, all right, because I've installed the ADT plugin, all right. This might take a while, so I'll click on it, take a sip of coffee. I'm not sure who the first one to do it was, Ubuntu or what, to give them, instead of numbers, to give them clever names, like. Um, yeah, it, it's alphabetical, so H, I, J, yeah, Juno would be the newest. Um, yeah, you, you, you could. Um, you, you, you don't necessarily have to. You probably can get it to work. All right. And here is, um, I'm going to delete this guy because I want to reopen them in a second. All right. And again, through this, let's see where I want. Oh, here's where you can get to those other Android things. So. For example, right through Eclipse, you can get through the, to the Android SDK manager, and also you can get to the AVD manager. So, you know, if you want to just have one nice little one-stop shop icon, that Eclipse one will get that to you. Now, how to open an existing project? Because the first week you're not going to be developing your own project; we're simply going to open one. Um, you go to File, Import. Import Android, existing Android code. Then browse for 
the applications. Now, the applications you can download from the website. It tells you where they are. In addition, um, if you'd rather, you can, you can snatch them off uh, the machines uh, in lab. Uh, the, the, the folder is there. You can zip them up and, 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 and uh, copy them. I'm going to browse and hope I remember where they were put. All right. In the, on this machine, they're in my documents. I'm not sure where they are on all the other machines. But if you expand that, you can go and you can see a set of different folders. And I'm going to pick the welcome application. So I pick the welcome and I click OK. Then I click finish and it imports it. All right. Now, when I expand it, you'll see there's a lot of stuff associated with the application. All right. We can go view it just through Windows Explorer if we want. You'll see there's a bin folder, an assets, a gen folder, an SRC, an RES, you know, source, resources, binaries, generated code, and assets. But it's nicely organized through here and, and it simplifies things. Now, I want to show you a couple of things that are, uh, I, I don't remember exactly what I require screenshots for, for the first lab. But I'll go through and show you some of the highlights and, and we'll explore this uh, more uh, in next class. First of all, I can double click on the Welcome Java and I can see the Java code to fire up this app. Hmm. Interesting, but I did test this last week. Uh, I'm not sure if a compile will fix this or not. I'll have to see. At any rate, um, an app consists of one or more activities. Uh, this is a, a very simple single screen app, so it consists of one activity. Think of an activity as, as something you want the user to do. So one screen, uh, an activity. And what this does essentially is it opens up the activity. So that's in the source file in the com.deedle.welcome package. And it's the welcome.java is the activity. That's the main, you know, that would be analogous to like the main class in regular Java. That's what gets the ball rolling. There's other things though at work here. There is in the resources folder in the layout, there is a main XML file. And that main XML file, you can either view in a sort of drag and drop GUI view, or you can uh, view the code behind of it. Very similar if you've done any .NET programming where you can actually see the code for your web form, all right? Or you can go into sort of a GUI view. And the GUIs are done via an XML file. Again, this would be roughly analogous to um, the ASPX file if you've done any .NET programming. So all these different things are controls that allow you to lay out the page, all right? This uses what's called a relative layout. There's several different ways that you can organize your page. One of the layout methods is called a relative layout. And we have then a text view control, an image view control, and another image view control. Lastly, we have an Android manifest file. And this gives information about the application. The name of it, 
the version of it and the SDK, the minimum SDK required, and so on. So the manifest is information about the application. Now, how many of you have an Android phone or have used one? Okay, you do? Have you? Have you? Yeah, that's something we can talk about because I actually don't have a cell phone right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, when you install an app in the Android, it, uh, uh, Android world, it tells you what permissions you have to grant the application. All right. So, for example, um, it may say that this application has the right to um, turn off all the audio because it has its own audio, or this has the this has the permissions to write to your your SD card, or this has uh, permission to you know block phone calls or whatever. All right. The manifest is where you put those permissions in as well. So information about the app goes in the manifest file. All right. So the three things that we looked at are sort of the boss, which is this Java class, the layout, which is stored in the XML file, and then finally the manifest, which is information about the application. Now I'm going to go and try to run this. I suspect I'm going to get errors, but we'll see what happens. There are, of course, other things in here that we can take a look at um, next time. There's, there's code that gets generated. All right. There are our resources. All the different images used in the app and so on. But we'll review those uh, later. So let's go and try to run this, run as Android application. And yeah, there are errors with that. I'm not really sure why. I'll have to troubleshoot that, hopefully for next time, so that we can get that uh, to work. Um, again. It was interesting going through the experience installing it here, all right, because I installed it on my machine at home, all right, got it going. Um, we installed it in machines upstairs in, in BU202, me and the lab guy, and we encountered some issues, you know. Uh, and then we installed it on this machine and we encountered some other issues. So. Um, different issues and I thought I got them all resolved but apparently there, there's still some remain. So it's a task and it's a chore to be able to do that. And, and the, the real reason is there's all these other, all those things that you need in the environment and they need to be correct in order for it to work. So again, your assignment is to get everything installed, all right, go and pull up that sample example and get some screenshots of the different things that I've identified. And I believe those are the three things that I asked for. And then also hopefully to run it. All right. So I would have probably gotten a B on this assignment because I was able to do everything but run it. All right. But we'll try harder next time. All right. Any questions? All right. I mean you can come to the lab if you want. Um, okay. Well, well, I'll go up to lab then. We'll go. Uh, do you want to go to lab or do you just want to? It doesn't matter. I mean, I have, I have it installed, but I, but I got, I got this. I started working through it. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll just address the questions now. Were you planning on going to lab or no? Okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll just, we we'll, might as well just address your questions here. All right.